preparing for the sermon, I was wrestling with a question that I have. Is how do you guys uh, relate to God? Not what you believe, but think about how you actually relate to God. For example, I mean, do you relate? Does, does God, when you talk to God, does it get you all excited? Like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to go see my best friend. Or is, is God more like someone that when you relate to that it's kind of like, ah, oh, man, you know, does he really want to see me today? I mean, he did see what I did last week, let alone last summer, right? And so, I mean, does, 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 how does it, I mean, do you feel like, oh, okay, God might want to smite me, you know, or I have to be good enough? I mean, I'll just be honest here, and I'm assuming you're like me because your heart is beating, that uh, there are times where I know the truth of the gospel, where Jesus loves us so much. I mean, the gospel is so amazing. I mean, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That God, you know, God, that God loves us. And we read in John 10 that he wants us to have life and life abundantly. And so many of my favorite promises of God, Ephesians 3.20, where it talks about, you know, how God wants to do immeasurably more than he can ask for or imagine. But all of these truths, I have to be honest, I catch myself relating to God differently than what I believe in my head. For example, I will approach God quite often on how my recent performance is. If I'm performing well, meaning if I'm behaving well and I'm not struggling with sin or I'm not messing up, which is quite often, you know, then I realize then, oh, okay, then I will go to God with joy and, and confidence. But then when I'm really, you know, tanking, which again, quite often, you know, then I'm nervous to go to God. And I feel like I have to do an extra, you know, routine or I have to, you know, oh, maybe I need to pray harder or I have to do some penance or, you know, I mean, it's just this religion stuff that I, that I can fall into. And it's crazy because it's stinking thinking that I know it's not true, but there's this old default pattern of how I relate to God. And I want us to grow in this way. Because if you're here today, you might be a guest checking out Jesus. And if that's so true, then I'm grateful you're here, and I want you to understand what a true relationship with Jesus is about. And if you're here and you're a believer in Jesus, then you need to understand that there's, Christ is supreme, and that because of his supremacy, our relationship with him is different as well. We've been going through this series in the book of Colossians about the supremacy of God. Born supremacy is what we titled it, meaning that Christ is supreme. And this, Colossians is such a cool book. It's only four chapters, right? And so, I mean, you can get through the whole book in about 10 minutes. And as you read it, you realize the first two chapters in the book of Colossians are all about the supremacy of Jesus. They're all about how Jesus is not just the one, not just a prominent one. He's not just a good God, but he's the God. He's just not just about, you know, having a special place in your heart. He's supposed to have the place in your heart. He's not just prominent, but what I like to say, preeminent, meaning before all and above all. This is who Jesus is. Now, we quite often can recognize this, but where I want us to grow today in our love for Jesus isn't just where we recognize who Jesus is, but the impact on how we relate to him because of who Jesus is. Does that make sense? Meaning because of who Jesus is, we're meant to radically be changed on how we relate to God. Let me give you an example in scripture. When Jesus came, he was having his disciples, and we read in Mark chapter 2 a great story where Jesus is having kind of a meal with his disciples. And the other first century pastors, and that's what we call Pharisees, that's what they were called, but they're basically first century pastors. And so the religious leaders of the first century went up to Jesus, and they noticed that Jesus was eating with his disciples, but it was at this time when the Pharisees were fasting. And perhaps it was a festival and it was a traditional day of fast. I'm not sure. It doesn't give those details. But either way, the Pharisees go up to Jesus and they ask him this question. Why aren't you fasting? And Jesus says something super profound. In Mark chapter 2, verse 21, let me read it to you. He says, No one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. 
and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour the new wine into new wineskins. Now, you may not drink wine, um, and you certainly don't use wine skins, all right? But there's a powerful thing. Jesus can care less about wine. But what he's trying to teach the people is something that they would readily know. That in the first century, they didn't have bottles, obviously, but they used wine skins for liquid, especially wine. And what happens with wine is that as it's brand new, it's still fermenting. And there's a lot of gases that are changing within the wine. And so it's, if you put... The bottles that they would have in first century were leather or this type of leather that wine of wine skin, and that as they got older, the leather wine skins they would harden. And if you put old, new wine in that, as that gas expanded, the wine would burst the old leather, and then all the wine and the wine skin would be ruined. So what Jesus is saying is, is that you don't do that. Instead, new wine, which is gases that are still expanding, you put into new wineskins because new wineskins are pliable. And as they gas expands, so too can the wine skin. Now, this has absolutely nothing to do with wine. What he's saying is, is that Jesus is new. The old way to relate to God, where you have to earn your performance with God, the old law, and that was what the Pharisees were doing, trying to be good enough by fasting and doing all these religious rituals, the old way of relating to God is no longer valid because the supreme one, that would be Jesus, the supreme one is now here, and he's the new wine. And so you don't put the new supreme one, the new covenant, into the old pattern of behavior. And that's exactly what the Pharisees were looking to Jesus to do. And so he's basically teaching me. He says, look it, I'm new. And I'm supreme. You don't put me into the old wineskins because I will break it. All right, if that, if that was too religious, let me break this in down to more simple. You used to relate to God on a variety of ways. A lot of you relate to God out of guilt. That means you're scared to go to God and you live in shame. And you're afraid that, you know what, if I go into church, the whole building would fall down. You know, and it's just, you'd be lucky to get out alive. You know, I mean, and this is just some people think this. And the other of you relate to God as though you don't need him. And other you are angry with him because you feel he's let you down. And those are all different types of you know, relations that we have to, many people feel like they have to earn God. And so they're constantly on this performance trap where maybe if I, if I just do this, if I just give enough money, if I, if I learn to speak Christianese, right, or whatever, you know, you, you think that the Christians do. And if you fall into that cultural pattern of, of religiosity, even in Christian religiosity, that maybe God will accept you and overlook your shortcomings. And that's the old way. But what Jesus is saying, and what we're looking at today, is that we have to leave the old and take on the new. See, we have a new gift, but if we put that new gift into our old pattern, it'll blow it up, and we will miss out on the blessings of God. Does that make sense? So if we basically take the treasure, and I'm going to assume, let me just assume that all of you here are believers, which I understand that it's not likely. But if you're a believer in Jesus, then you're saved. You have been given the new wine by faith and the grace of God. But if you put that old wine into your old behavior, your old type of lifestyle, in your old thinking, the gift that you have, the free gift you have, is going to blow up your old life and you're not going to get to enjoy the benefits that God has for you. Because you're still going to be operating on your old life. You have the gift. It's the new wine. You're just trying to put the new wine in the old skin. And this is exactly what Apostle Paul is talking about in the book of Colossians. The first two chapters, again, are about who Christ is, the supremacy of God. And the second two chapters are because he is supreme, because you have the new wine, because Christ is the new covenant, because he is above all, he's preeminent, not just prominent, but preeminent. Because of that, you now are meant to relate to God differently. 
You're meant to relate. Not because you have it all together. Not because of you. But because he is new. He has made all things new. Now, here's the challenge. I struggle with that. Because I am constantly wrestling with my old thinking, my old nature. This side of heaven, I still have this flesh which wrestles with sin. This side of heaven, I still have my own thoughts. I still get bombarded by all sorts of lies and things of this world. And so there's something that Scripture tells us, and one of a passage that I encourage you to think upon is Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. It says this really thing that's, that some people get mixed up. It actually says in Philippians 2, 12, it says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, when you first read that, you say, well, wait a second, Christians anyways, they'll say, wait a second, I thought that you weren't saved by works. You're not. But you have to continue to wrestle with what it means to be saved. Does that make sense? Meaning the fact that the, the glorious gift of salvation, how you are a new creation in Christ, how you are called to be an ambassador, a minister of reconciliation, a royal priest, as though God himself is making his very appeal through you. That very truth that you have, you have to wrestle with because you live still and you wrestle with your own body. And so what he's saying, what we read in Philippians 2.12 is what we have to learn to work that out. The very truth of the gospel, the very truth of God's word, within our lives, the very truth of God's grace, we have to work out. We have to diligently press through. We have to wrestle with it, the fact of God's truth in our lives, because we still live in this old form, but we are new creations. And so what he's saying is, is that let's do the work. And so that's what I want you guys to walk away with today. First, I want you to understand that you have been given new wine. You've been given a new covenant, a new gift from God because Christ is supreme. And that's a new way that you are to relate to God. But for you to relate to God, you must do the work and get rid of the old and bring in the new. Here's how you do that. I want to share with you three practical ways to do that, that you can take and apply to your life, but you'll have to work on it. I'm not going to sit there and tell you, oh, okay, you have this in your head. You're going to go out there, and it's just going to be like this magic formula, and it's going to work. No, these are going to be exercises that you can do that Scripture teaches us how we can do that. Remember, Philippians, Colossians, excuse me, is very practical. The first two are very theological, meaning they're talking about the foundation of who God is. And the second two are very practical in the sense, because of who Jesus is, this is how we're to live in Christ. So turn to me. We're going to look at verses 15 and 16. I know, two whole verses today, okay? We're going to go deep. All right, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 15, 16 and 17. So turn with me to that. Let's read what the Word of God says here. In verse 15, it says, Let the peace of Christ... Rule over your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. Okay, first I just want us to really look at verse 15. We read, it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. For you've been given peace in God. Isn't that cool? In God, we have peace now with God. That where we were once separated from God because of our sin, Jesus Christ, the Supreme One, has brought peace where there was division, where there was animosity between us and God. Because of our sin, we now have peace with God. And it's because of that we read that we are to let that peace rule our hearts. And it's that key word that I want us to grasp, grasp right now is rule. Think for a second as you listen. What rules your heart? What rules your heart? What governs? The Greek word is, comes from a type of um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? It, it comes from a type of sports. It's basically saying referees or judges your heart is what it really means. So what judges, what sets the rules, what set and governs, what declares what is a victory and what is a, what is a defeat within your heart? What rules your heart? You see, the Apostle Paul is writing this to the believers in Colossians in the first century because they had forgot that Christ was supreme in their life, and they started to think that maybe that they needed to add a little bit on, that maybe Jesus wasn't quite enough. And so what they were adding on is, since Jesus isn't quite enough, maybe I need to also govern and rule my heart by a little bit of performance. And when that performance isn't a good, then you start to see what creeps in is a little bit of resentment and anger. And sometimes it can be fueled by bitterness, rage, malice, or even selfish ambition. Different things in to creep up within our hearts. In fact, if you look at verse 18 of chapter 2, I'll read it to you. We read the Apostle Paul warns them of this. In verse 18, we says, it says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels, and this is what I want you to look at the word, disqualify you. You know what the word disqualify is? It's actually rooted in that same word, rule. It just means rule against. He says, don't let anyone who worships angels, or basically what they're saying is, don't let anyone who's into the performance trap disqualify you from the peace of God. Now, let's make this practical now that you kind of got the Christianese verse there. Don't allow your performance, good or bad, to rule your heart. Make sense? Don't allow your selfish ambitions don't allow greed. Don't allow the, this pursuit of material possessions. Don't allow, you know, the lust of the eyes, whatever that may be, to rule your heart. Only allow the peace of God to rule your heart. Now, what is the peace of God? I mean, how do I manifest that? Ah, okay. <laughs> I mean, what is the peace of God? The peace of God is the grace of God. We read in 1 Colossians, uh, Colossians 1.20, it says, We have been given peace through Christ who shed his blood on the cross. What he's referring to in this context of the peace of God is simply the grace of God given through the new relationship we have because of the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. So, Practically speaking, you allow your identity and your position in Christ to govern your life. I'm a new believer. I'm a new creation. That will govern my life. I'm an ambassador of Christ. That's going to rule my life. I am forgiven. I am made righteous. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ. These are things that are called to govern my heart, rule my heart, I'm not going to disqualify myself when I sin. Why? Because I have a redeemer and there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to have to try to earn God's love because God has already demonstrated his love. He can love me no more, no less because he is perfect. He is love. He sent his son to die for me. I don't have to sit there and try to judge myself based on my successes or failures. I now judge myself based on what Jesus has done. I am now free to respond to God out of love, not out of fear, guilt. My motivation is now being brought from a peace of Christ. And when I allow the peace of God, the grace of God to rule in my heart, I have new motivation not to earn God's favor, but in response to God's favor. And it's the cart before the horse. When you're trying to earn God's favor, you're putting the cart before the horse. But when you try to respond to God's favor, you're allowing God to motivate you versus your fear, guilt to motivate you. It is completely different. It has a different result. One is religion, the other is relationship. And they're going to end, one's going to end in bitterness, despair, and ultimately death. The other is going to end in joy, love, and peace. What are you allowing to rule in your heart?
I mean, to be honest, as I reflect on this passage, as I was writing this sermon, I just said, man, there's so many different things that I see ruling my heart. It's like this merry-go-round that goes on in my heart. I mean, things get on and off. I mean, it's just like, it's hectic in there, I'll tell you, okay? I mean, it's just, you know, there's times where I see greed is ruling my heart, where I have to wrestle with the simple fact that, you know what, hey, maybe this isn't, you know, maybe Jesus isn't enough. Maybe I should add on to Jesus. It should be Jesus and money. Okay, man, isn't that our favorite one? Okay, I mean, it's like, you know, because money's going to bring me some peace and joy, and he's saying, boom, nope, the peace of God is what to rule my heart, not the peace of money, you know? And then he says, oh, but maybe then it's a relationship, you know? And anyone who's married can tell you, nope, that's not going to work, okay? You know, I mean, it's, a, it's the peace of God. I mean, money and relationships are gifts from God, but they're not going to bring you peace and fulfillment in life. And so what do you rule in your heart? This is why we have to continue to work out our salvation. Where we're continuing to surrender our hearts over to God and say, Lord, enable me to allow your peace to govern and rule my heart. You're going to be tempted and bombarded by all things around you to allow everything else to rule in your heart. The Pharisees in the first century were ruled by fear, greed, and religion. Today, many believers, dare I say most believers, are ruled by the same. They have the gift of God, but they're putting the gift of God in old wineskins. And so the gift is being just poured out God doesn't want one drip of his blessings to miss out. So it works, verse 16 works on 15. Imagine that. Have your heart, uh, your peace of heart ruled. How do you do that? How do you help rule your peace of heart? What does he say in verse 16? Verse 16 it says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. I want to just think of this as getting a new heart and focusing on a new mind. Dwell, dwell. As I was thinking about this, I realized what he's really saying is dwell on God's truth. I mean, let the word of God, let the message of God dwell within your heart or dwell within your minds. Let the peace of Christ dwell in your, rule your heart and the message of God dwell in your minds. He's basically doing heart transplants here little by little. You know, you got a heart transplant and then he's washing your mind and he's telling you to let God's peace rule your heart and let God's rule your mind. And it works together when we allow God's wor- word to dwell within our minds, to rule our minds, we then are more focused on God's grace and his truth. Let me explain how this practically works in all of our lives. When God called Joshua, to go into the new promised land of the gift that he had, not too different than what God is calling us today as he wants us to live in the new promise that he has given us. He told Joshua, I want you to do a couple things for me. But one of the most profound things that he asked Joshua to do was to hide his word within his heart and to meditate upon his word within his heart. Why do this, you guys? Is because you're stinking thinking. Okay, because you have a tendency to meditate on your old beliefs. You have a tendency to meditate on the lies of this world. And what God wants is as you face the day, is for you to have ammo in your head, is for you to keep your thoughts not just on the old things of this life, but continually to renew your thinking on the promises of God. And so as you go out there and you remember the grace of God, because you're holding on to the grace of God, when you're facing sins, you have 
have on to the promise of John 1, 9 or in John 1, 8 that says, if you say you don't sin, you're a liar. But the promise of John, 1 John 1, 9 is that if you confess your sin to Christ, he is faithful to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And that's the promise of God. And in John 15, where it says, if we remain in Christ, we're going to bear fruit for his kingdom. In Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has plans for our lives to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us a hope in the future. It's these promises that I hold on to, that I renew my mind with when I'm facing my own failures, when I'm facing those roadblocks in my life that don't seem to be opening up or I have no clue how I'm going to get around this roadblock. But I hold on to the promise of God and I renew my mind by what God's word says so I won't fall victim to the lies of my own self. That old stinking thinking, those lies. And man, let me tell you, we have real estate in the ghetto. You do. You have real estate in your head of old lies. And we play this tape recorder in our lives, don't, in our minds, don't we? It's like everyone has that old 8-track, or I'm old, okay? Everyone has that old seat or MP3. There you go. All right, everyone has that old MP3 that they just play. Boop. And it just tells them these old lies that they sit there and listen to. And like, oh, yeah. And God says, nope. Meditate, dwell, hide the word of God. Sing songs, hymns to one another. One of my favorite verses in Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, and it talks about what our true act of worship is. And he says, you know, in view of God's mercy, and you could even argue, say, in view of God's supremacy, in view of his mercy, he says, I want you to offer up your bodies as living sacrifices. Oh, what a powerful thing that is. And he says, this is your spiritual act of worship. But then he says something really crazy. He goes, I don't want you to conform to the pattern of this world, but I want you to be transformed. How are we transformed? by the renewing of our minds. That's how we're transformed. How we renew our minds? By meditating on the word of God. How do we allow the peace of God to dwell within our hearts, to rule our hearts? By holding on to the promises of God. See, they work together. We allow the peace of God to rule our hearts and we hold on to the word of God. Ephesians 4 says this exact same principle. Let me read it to you. In Ephesians 4, verse 23, it says, You were taught with regard to your former way, your former old way of life, to put off your old self, your old wineskin, okay? Which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. That's our stinking thinking. To be made new in the attitudes of your mind and to put on the new self, the new wineskins, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, if we are to experience the gift, the joy, the blessings that God has already given us, we cannot live in our old form life. We have to let go of the old and grab a hold of the new. We can no longer allow ourselves to relate to God as we used to. And we have to work this out. You guys, you have to wrestle with this. You have to be aware of what are you allowing to rule your heart. Is it the peace of God or the things of this world? What are you thinking on? Are you dwelling on the promises of God The word of God, or are you dwelling on the things of this world? The difference is profound. It's not your salvation. You aren't saved by how much Bible you read. Okay, You're saved already by the grace of God. But are you going to get to enjoy that grace of God, or is that going to go and spill out everywhere? Does that make sense? One last thing, close with this. I love this. What's, What's common in both of those verses? with an attitude of gratitude, with thankfulness. I was just thinking, do you know whenever I pray, or excuse me, whenever I eat at our house a meal, I always have my little girl pray, and I actually have her pray. I pray sometimes, but quite often I want her to pray. I say, Skylar, it's your turn, you pray. And it's, it's so funny, one of the key things I want to teach her is not God bless my food, to be honest with you. I actually intentionally don't say that because I don't, I think God's already going to bless my food. But what I want him to do is I want myself and Skyla 
to recognize, who's my daughter, by the way, uh, if, if, you, if you missed that, um, it, to recognize that God is our provider and to give him thanks. That's why I do it. It's because I want her to think and to praise God that he is the one that's provided for us this food. And the reason why is because when we do that, we have a new awareness of the blessings that God has given us. You ever wonder why we worship God and why God calls us to worship him? Is it because he's some ego maniac up there and he needs a spiritual buff? Boy, come on now. Raise those hands up high, guys. How much do you love me? Okay, that's stupid. All right, that's not the way God works. God wants us to be exuberant in our worship, to go beyond and to love him and all that stuff, not because he's desperately in need of a spiritual buff, but because he recognizes as we thank him, as we praise him, as we focus on his gifts, it is our hearts that change. It is a newness that, that overwhelms up within us. We worship God, and as we worship God, we are the ones changed. Believe it or not, you bless God. You are the ones who the benefactor is. That's how it works. It's not because God needs that. It's because God understands we need that. This is why we worship God. I'm telling you, it's amazing. We're sitting there and we're thinking about ourselves and our selfishness and our own problems. And then all of a sudden we're like, boom, God is in control. I'm going to sing about God's sovereignty. I'm going to sing about how my heart needs to follow God. Half the worship songs I sing are prayers. Why? Because there's like, oh, I give all to God. And then I say, oh, crap, Lord, I don't give all to you. You know, and this is what's going on in my head. And I'm just thinking, yeah, I need to ask God to help me do that. You know, and then I sit there and I'm praying and I'm just praying these songs to myself. You know, and I'm just thinking, yeah, Lord, and I'm, I'm the one being transformed. This is what it's all about. He wants us to have an attitude of gratitude. Three simple pieces for us to work out the new life so we can let go of the old. One is to allow the peace of God to rule in your hearts. Check your hearts. What are you allowing to rule you? And then to dwell richly upon the promises of God. Let the word of God dwell richly within you. What promises are you holding on to? And last, continue to have an attitude of gratitude. God's promises are true and they're real. What you focus on is going to dictate your direction. If you're looking this way, that's going to steer where you go. If you're focusing on God, you're going to lean towards God. You guys, God has already given you all the blessings in the world. It's true. He's not, he can't give you more. He's already died for you. He's already enabled you to have everything. We read that in Peter. All the spiritual blessings have been given to the body of Christ. But we're not all receiving them because we try to stick the blessings into our old lives. You can't do that. You ever wonder why the most miserable people are are Christians who have one foot in the old world and one foot in the kingdom of God? It just doesn't work. Say, try to do the splits, but it doesn't work. No matter how flexible you are, it isn't going to work. You're going to tear the wineskin, and God's blessings are going to go outward and you're going to miss them, and it will ruin the blessings and your old life, and your old life. I want to encourage you. Ask yourself, do a heart check. How are you relating to God? Are you living in the peace and the power of God? Or are you relating to him based on your old life? He's blessed you. He wants you to have that promise. I'm going to ask Pastor Joe Choi to come out in the venue, as well as Nathan to come out here in the sanctuary, and we are going to have a time of response to God. This is exactly what we've been talking about. It's a time for you to commune with God, not based on your performance, but based on the grace of God. I wanted you to do something new. I want you today fresh to go to God and say, Lord, in confidence, Jesus, I go to you in confidence because you love me so much because of who you are, not because of who I am. We're going to have prayer warriors up here. I'm going to invite the prayer warriors to come forward, and they're going to be up here today as well. And if you want to receive prayer, we want to pray for you. We want to encourage you. We want to strengthen and walk with you. No matter what you're going through, God is there for you.